Hi, I'm Christine Tintinger. I'm Senior Keeper of Primates here at Auckland Zoo. I've been here for many, many years, seen the zoo changing. So probably a good 40 years I've had experience working with the animals here. I always wanted, even from a young child, I always wanted to work with animals. I read a lot of armchair travel, Gerald Durrell's books I was fascinated by. And even though I didn't want to work out in the, in the jungles where you, know, you didn't have the comforts of home, I wanted to work with animals. I was involved in an animal science association when I was Karatani nursing. And part of that association, they actually started the zookeeping course so I was the first one on the course doing the specific zookeeping option. And so um, I got to know all the people and also um, Graham Meadows, who was the curator vet here at Auckland Zoo at the time. He was the one, thankfully, that actually um, employed me in the very beginning. Come on. Here we go, one there, one there. So when I first started here back in the late 70s, 1970s, it was a whole different world here at Auckland Zoo. It was a very male dominated role, but I think that was the era, not only here in, a, in the zoo. And I came in on the, the first wave of the females. I wasn't the first female keeper, and I'm, I'm thankful for that, that others led the way. So by the time I came along, perhaps a couple of years later, there were a small hardcore of female keepers and um, that helped to uh, pave the way to having half employees here now are female keepers. For some reason my passion was for primates but at the time you would have to get experience of course and so um, when I first came here I was on the ungulates and then I went to carnivores and I did birds and reptiles so I went all around the, the zoo to get a wider experience but my passion for the primates that I never worked with before still remain so then I was lucky enough to get on to the primate section and work on the primate section. In the late 50s around the world but specifically in London um, they bred uh, chimpanzees to um, perform in what they called tea parties. They were um, dressed up in clothes to look like little people. Uh, they sat around tables and were given uh, things to eat and drink, hence the tea party. And people would often pay to come and sit and watch them being cute and funny. Um, what London Zoo did was very influential throughout zoos in the world, in New Zealand here as well. And so the chimps that came to us um, had that upbringing. They were very humanised um, and related more to people than they did to their own species. But by 1963, um, through public opinion and zoo opinion for the welfare of the animals, um, it had started to decline. So the Tea Party um, era was coming to an end, thank goodness. When I came here in um, 1979 to start my zookeeping career, we had three ex-Tea Party chimps, Josie, Janie and Bobby. My role in caring for them as it was with all the animals, was to um, look after their, um, obviously their physical well-being, but also with those guys, it was more the mental well-being as well. And so a lot of the time was actually spent just being their companion animals, interacting with them, just keeping them company, keeping them reassured that everything was okay. Janie was the last tea party chimp here, and of course she was by herself. Janie actually absolutely thrived just having us as company. And they do live a long time and she got to her 60th year. So yes, I had known Janie as a chimpanzee, as an animal, sorry, but also as a, if I can be anthropomorphic and say a friend as well, because I was deeply, deeply privileged to have known her as a personality and for her to have known me as well. Sorry, it's been many years now since she's passed away. But when I think about her and um, what we could give her and what she gave back to me, as you can see, it makes me quite sad, yes. Sad but happy that I had that time with her, yeah. In the many, many years I've been here, the zoo has evolved majorly. 
When it first started, even obviously before I came, it was just a menagerie. We have come in a long way. And now we are a, a conservation, scientific-based organisation. Quite often, people will come to the zoo and are just amazed by the actual natural environment that we offer. As people come in, they will be delighted in what they see, but in that delight, they'll also be enlightened about the animals that they see in front of them and the environment they see in front of them and where do they live in the wild and what's their status in the wild, are they endangered? In 2010, I had the absolute privilege um, to go to Sumatra, literally into the wilds of Sumatra. It was just so, so different to anything I'd ever done before and that made it even more special and exciting. But also I was able to see on the ground talking to people who were dealing with issues in real time. The Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Programme that we support here at Auckland Zoo, I actually went to the areas to actually physically see what they were doing. Going out and rescuing orangutans that have been shut in someone's garage, bought as a tiny baby on the pet trade, and because they are apes, they will live for a long time. So um, I saw some animals that had been rescued and then be released into the wild. Advances in animal welfare have gone in leaps and bounds over the many years that this zoo has been here, but certainly in the many years that I have been here. We use a science-based approach to um, assess or measure the um, welfare of animals, and we do that by using the five domains of the animal welfare model that is used internationally. So we analyse their diet, their environment, their physiological state, their mental state, we have the vets come on board and give us instruction and guidance for that as well. We have what we call a species action plan for each animal here at the zoo. And every year we will sit down and do a comprehensive overall look of their welfare. The habitat behind me where the Siamangs are, this has been many years in the making. Our brilliant horticultural department they have been sourcing the specific trees and the heights and the maturity of the trees to be put into the habitats. This is a science. This doesn't happen overnight and it's been very well calculated. But looking at this, it's all natural. You wouldn't realise it's all been well calculated and thought out and mapped out and drawn out. You've also got the aerial pathways. We're trying to simulate what would happen in the wild, that they would be living high up interacting with each other, getting food. This creates a very healthy body as well. So the design of the habitat is enriching for the animals. Orangutans are brilliant problem solvers. They can think outside the square. So behaviour enrichment enables us to give animals species specific items for them to manipulate. So first of all, you get your pine cone and that's a nice open one. Um, so it means that you can put the food or whatever you're doing right down. And obviously this is a lovely mixture of mashed vegetables. And what you do is you just get some and you push it right down because it, then it makes it more of a challenge for the orangutans. So they need to go and get a stick or a, a tool and break it off and get the last little skerricks of um, food that are right down in the, in the base there. Some of the um, smaller animals, we can do exactly the same, but we might put a tie there, and then I can tie it onto branches. Over the many years, I've quite perfected the art of pine cone stuffing. <laughs> the reason why I've been here for so long is that I want to do the best for the animals in my care. And a lot of the animals in my care, the primates, they live a long time. You're in the game for the long haul, and I say that in a nice way. I've known Charlie over 30 years. Yeah, isn't he magnificent? I remember him when he was sort of about that big and he didn't have the flanges or anything or the big huge bulk of an adult male and he wasn't all hairy like he is now. It's amazing when you look at the eyes of an animal and then you see, you see them as they were, you know, when, when I first knew him when he was six years old. When I first started, I never had thoughts that, you know, Many, many years later, we'd be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the zoo. 
as you can see, I'm a little bit more mature than some of the people around here. Um, and so it's just nice to be able to um, talk about the past and the, the animals that used to be here and the habitats that used to be here and what we used to do and what we're doing now and where we're going. And this is where, you know, body willing, I will be here until I retire, yes. This is utterly amazing that I'm still privileged enough to still be working with the animals, working in this environment, and I will continue to, to go on, even if I have to have a Zimmer frame to come and visit Charlie. I'll be here, yeah.